Chairman, we are now live. Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's virtual meeting of the Corporate Services, Commerce and Communities Policy Overview Committee at the London Borough of Hillingdon. This virtual meeting is also being broadcast simultaneously on the Council's YouTube channel, which is Hillingdon London. The purpose of this committee is to monitor council services and their performance within its remit, as well as undertaking in-depth reviews and witness sessions on topics, submitting any findings to the decision-making cabinet. My name is Councillor Richard Mills and I'm chairman of this meeting. Before we start, some important online housekeeping for everyone present. Uh, grateful if you could ensure that any mobile phones around you are on silent. Please keep your microphone muted when not speaking but remember to unmute when you are called to speak. And as chairman, I will call you when you have an opportunity to speak. As per previous meetings, grateful if you could limit your question to uh, as concise as possible, and then you'll be entitled to one follow-up depending following the response. Um, and then we will go to other councillors before returning. So please indicate if you wish to speak and I will make sure I take note of you. In terms of technical meeting control, if any councillor leaves the virtual meeting partway through for a period of time, I will continue the meeting unless we are not quorum, which is five councillors in total. Before we move on to the agenda, I'd like to do a roll call of councillors to confirm your attendance. So please indicate you are present when I say your name. Councillor Bridges. Good evening, Chairman. I'm present. Councillor Brightman. Good evening, Chairman. I'm present. Councillor Deville. Councillor Deville, I think you're on mute. Uh, sorry, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Goddard. Evening, Chairman, I'm present. Councillor Dillon. Good evening, Chairman. Good evening, everyone present. Councillor Bliss. Good evening, I'm present. And Councillor Farley. Good evening, Chairman, present. Thank you. And from officers from the London Borough of Hillingdon, first of all, Luke Taylor. I'm present, Chairman. Kevin Byrne. Yes, I'm present, Chairman. Thank you. And Ian Anderson. Yes, Chairman, I'm present. Thank you. We now move on to the agenda for the meeting. Agenda item one is apologies for absence. We've had apologies from Councillor Haranji. Thank you. Agenda item two is declarations of interest in matters before this meeting. And I'll take it that there are no interests unless anyone has anything to declare now. Thank you. Agenda item three is to receive and agree the minutes of the last meeting held on 17th of September 2020. Does anyone wish to indicate to make any comments on those or are we happy to take them as agreed? Okay, take that as agreed, thank you. Agenda item four is around the exclusion of press and public. All items coming before us this evening are to be held in public. Which brings us to the first main item on the agenda which is agenda item five which is the annual complaints and service monitoring report that Ian Anderson is going to present to us, please. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, Councillor Bridges has heard all of this before, so I'm, I'm sorry to repeat some of this already to him. Um, I think I'd like to start, although we'll focus mainly on complaints and members' inquiry, on page 35 and over to 36, you'll see that there is a poem there. Um, and what I'd like to do is just bring to your attention that poem. It, it, it's from a young person who's had services provided by the council. And what she's done is she's written about the service that she's received. And actually it, it reflects so well on the council in terms of what she's experienced and the benefits she's had from contact with, it, with the council. I'm not saying every experience is like that for every individual, but it shows you the type of experience that some people can have. Um, in terms of my report, just going through some of the, the figures that I think I'll just share with you, is that the, the, the complaint process has an informal and a formal stage. In terms of the informal stage overall, um, what it shows is that from 2018-2019, 2,756 uh, informal complaints were received and that was down to 2,339, a 15% drop roughly from one year to the next. In terms of the formal complaint stages, the total number of stage one complaints was 837 for 2018, 2019, and 861 for 2019, 20, uh, a 3% 3 
um, uh, increase. So not massive, but there's nonetheless an increase. In terms of stage two, again, a small increase from 73 for 2018 to 2019, and then um, 80 for the following year. There were no stage three complaints. In terms of the local government ombudsman and the housing service ombudsman, the total number of complaints they uh, investigated for 2018-19 was 86, and for 2019-20, that was 59. So it's, it's quite a significant reduction, actually, in terms of the number of complaints they investigated. In terms of the total number of compliments, um, so far, uh, for 2018-2019, it was 234, and then for 2019-20, 301. Now, that's an increase, uh, a significant increase, really, in, in terms of the number of compliments. And if I were to say to you that, and I, and I can say to you that, looking at the figures for this financial year so far, for the first sort of six months, the figures heading towards about 600 odd compliments that we will receive for the year going ahead. The, the main areas of compliments this year, uh, to this, this financial year, is actually been on uh, wildflowers, the amount of wildflowers across the council that people have complimented. And actually councillors have done so as well. So it's just a, a, a number of people just complimenting about that. The total number of members inquiries for 2018-19 was 11,675. And for 2019-20, it was 11,423. So a, a small drop, but fairly consistent, really, in terms of the volume of members' inquiries. Um, what I have been asked by another uh, policy overview committee is to provide that summary for the next five years. So what I will do for the year for, for next year, rather than just receiving it for two years, you'll receive a five-year analysis. So you can actually see what the trend is over the five-year period and then form a view as to you know what, what's what's happening overall. Just some of the detail, if I may just go through, of the formal complaints, of the 861 stage one complaints recorded for 2019-20, uh, 80 escalated to stage two, which suggests to me that 91% has actually 91% um, of complaints from stage one to two have in some ways been resolved because they've not gone on to stage two, which is sort of a, a loose sort of um, analysis, but it, it can be said that there is some level of satisfaction there in terms of what the officers are doing at stage one to focus on the resolution. In terms of the ombudsman investigation, it has reduced from 86 to 59, which is it's a, it's a fairly significant number. And when I was looking at it, there isn't a particular reason why that would be the case. It just so happens that they've looked at fewer uh, complaints that have been recorded at their, uh, you know, at the ombudsman's end. And it might well be because as the number of complaints go down through the complaint process, so at stage one, you get a fairly big number, stage two, you get a smaller number, and then at stage three, you either get nothing or something. Uh, so the ombudsman has fewer com complaints to actually investigate uh, in, in that respect. Um, in terms of the actual compliments, um, it's increased from 234 to 301, which is a significant increase. And I would say to you, the main areas that it's increased for 2019, so 2020, was in the area of repairs, where people were satisfied with the volume of repairs that we've actually done. Um, and I think that's a compliment to us in terms of what's happened there. One of the areas which generates a lot of complaints is um, it, it's in two areas. One is the volume of um, delays that takes place. So if we delay in the way we handle things, it normally results in a, compl a complaint of some form. The other area that generates a fair number of complaints is in the, in the communication, whether it's poor communication or it's just simply that we've not responded. There are two fairly big areas that across the council tends to attract a fair number of complaints. Now, looking at the figures in terms of the timeliness of responses for the complaints, um, the finance section, which primarily deals with council tax, housing benefit, of those, of the 213 complaints that were, were dealt with at that service area, 210 were actually dealt with within, uh, within time. That's 99%, which is a significant achievement. Adult social care, of the 45 complaints recorded, 42 were dealt with within target, which was 93%. In terms of children, uh, children's services, of the 85 complaints that were recorded, 73 were dealt with within target, which is 86%. The area where the greatest number of uh, complaints are in resident services, there was 518 
in total resident service complaints. Of those, 372 were dealt with within time. That's a 72% um, performance achievement, which is a drop from the year before of 85%. So it's one of the areas that I'm working closely with the various uh, services uh, to try and improve the, the actual performance in, the, in that respect, because uh, we do need to improve performance in terms of the speed of responses. The main areas where we've not met, uh, where our performance is lower in the resident services will be in the areas of highways, repairs, homeless prevention, antisocial behaviour. So it's those four areas where the, the, the timeliness of our responses needs to be quicker. In terms of members' inquiries, of the 11,423 uh, members' inquiries recorded for 2019 and 20, one area completely dwarfs all the other areas, and that's the waste services. Of those areas, waste services accounted for five, well, 5,949 uh, inquiries, which is more than almost any, well, it is more than any other area and more than many other areas combined. Um, so it's it's the it's it's probably it is no doubt it's the greatest number of uh, uh, members inquiries that we receive. I think that's probably my um, quick summary of what's happened, and I'm very happy to sort of deal with any uh, questions and inquiries that you well, want to raise. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, if anyone else would like to ask a question, please indicate. I see Councillor Goddard first, but if anyone else wants to indicate, please uh, let me know. Councillor Bliss will follow. Thank you, Councillor Goddard. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I mean, I, I do take the point, Ian, that um, generally this uh, this report is good news. I, I guess if there's one area that uh, perhaps strikes me as less good news um, is if I look at page 15 and I look at page 20 in terms of the amount of time that has to be expended uh, in resolving issues that get uh, to stage one and to stage two. I mean, it's quite... Uh, quite extensive in terms of the, uh, the expenditure of time, isn't it? Um, what I notice is that you don't actually give us any statistics in terms of the amount of time that has to be expended on average with uh, things that get referred to the Ombudsman. Um, and I would be interested to understand that. And I guess a, a comment that goes with this, clearly um, it would seem to me that uh, the more in which we can deal with complaints at the uh, informal stage, um, the better. Uh, and perhaps if there's something to aspire to here, it's it's a reduction in the percentage of leakage from informal complaints through to stage one. Councillor, you're spot on in terms of the in terms of the informal stage side of things. The focus of the council is to try and deal with it informally. Um, and the, the, the sheer number of uh, compl uh, informal complaints we receive is far more, far more than any other any of the formal stages. So that's where we tend to invest all of our time, uh, and that's where the staff focus their attention on trying to get it sorted. So that's definitely the focus. And you're right; it's much easier uh, and it's much quicker to resolve an informal complaint than it is once it goes through the formal stages. Because as soon as it goes through the formal stages, which is the other two questions you you referred to, there is a bureaucratic process we have to follow, which is time consuming. There's no doubt about that. So for my team, for example, to register one complaint, for each complaint will take between 10 and 15 minutes just to register that. So just to log it. Um, you then have officers who then have to investigate it. You then got to draft the response. And then once you've drafted the response, the investigating officer has to make sure that everything's, uh, they're happy with everything. Depending on the, the complexity of the complaint, it could take the, the formal actual, the processing of the complaint could take anything from an hour to five, six hours, just depending on the complexity. So when you say that the, the time involved, you've, you're absolutely right that at the informal state is where it's we have the quick wins, but once it gets into the formal stages, it is very time consuming. Um, so if you ask me an average time that it would take to um, resolve a formal complaint if you include the the logging the lo the and the actual responding and then the actual um, the, the logging out of the complaint as well on average I would say it's between two and three hours and you know that's that's what you're looking at so an officer at, at a fairly senior level is having to spend that length of time 
just on one complaint on average. So, um, so it, it's significant time involvement. But I think that the way the council sees it is complaints are important. It's a means of getting feedback. It's a, a means of learning and it's a means of putting right what's gone wrong. So it, it, it does definitely see it as that. But sometimes it does take that length of time to sort out because some some issues are so tricky that you just need to make sure that you've covered everything so that when you do send the response, the response the uh, complainant gets um, stops at that point rather than escalating further because if it escalates to stage two and then it escalates to stage three, that's even more time that's consuming uh, at an even more senior level. So that's that's kind of like the focus there. The question that you raise about the um, ombudsman is, um, it, it's not been asked before actually, councillor, but it is actually um, a really interesting point that you, that you make, only because when a complaint goes to the ombudsman, they will then write down the various inquiries that they've got that they want us to answer. And that could be uh, one side or it could be five sides. And the complexity of those questions and can be um, quite time consuming to respond to because they will be asking you questions because they don't know the background to the case and therefore they want to know everything that they can in order for them to provide the best response that they can to the complainant. So if you're asking me for an average time from where, I, where, where a, a formal complaint might take two or three hours, when it comes to the ombudsman, I would need to be involved. A senior manager would need to be involved. Uh, you'd have a, lot, a number of officers who would also need to be involved. You're looking at five, six hours There's, you know, in terms of putting it all together um, because it has to go through a number of stages as well before it goes to the ombudsman. So the officer has to provide the information and that would be usually some... Um, uh, paperwork that they would need to provide, then that would need to be cleared by the relevant director, then that would then need to be cleared by myself, then there will be times when some responses are um, of a nature that it would require either the deputy chief exec or the chief exec to clear as well. So all of those would just are, are time, you know, time consuming in doing that. But then what happens is once we've provided that information, the ombudsman then review what we've provided, and then they will provide us with a draft decision once they provided with a draft decision, we then have to review that draft decision and then say whether we accept that draft decision. Now that would take another, an hour, and that's, I would say an hour on average, if the draft decision is in our favor. If it's not, then it takes a lot longer because then we then have to review everything that we've done and see if there's anything additional that we want to add to that. So we then respond to that draft decision and say, yeah, we accept it or we don't accept it. And if we don't accept it, what our reasons for that is. The ombudsman then go back and they will then undertake a review and then they will then issue a final decision. Once a final decision is issued, if it's a negative decision, then we then have to undertake the various recommendations that uh, we are required to do so. And that would take um, two, three hours of our time just to do that. So, you know, all in all, that could take something like a full day, 10 hours, 11 hours in total of work, just look, just focusing on one ombudsman investigation. Uh, the other thing that I would, I would say to you is that the ombudsman themselves will spend a considerable time going through the paperwork. So you're looking at another individual who will then have to speak to their uh, assistant director. It could take them four or five hours of their time. So one ombudsman investigation would take a huge amount of time in terms of uh, staff time. But there is one other type of complaint which I've, I, I haven't have mentioned to you, which takes much, much longer than that. And that is the children's complaints. We have uh, a children's complaints procedure, which operates at three tiers. We have the uh, formal stage one children's complaints, which requires us to investigate at officer level. And that usually, um, will take someone between two and three hours to investigate that. But at stage two, the council has to employ, has to commission two independent people. They would be two people that are skilled at investigating um, a, a children's complaint. It'll be th something to do with looked after or send uh, or some form of abuse or something like that. What happens is those two independent people then have to interview every, every single member of staff that's involved, the directors, complaint handlers. Um, they've got uh, 60 working days to do that. And that could take anything between 20 
to 30 hours of those people's work at just that level. For each individual children's complaints, it costs the council in terms of financially, it costs the councils on average between five and eight thousand pounds per complaint. If it then escalates to stage three, which is a review of uh, the, 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 the actual children's handling process, that can take anything between another four and eight thousand pounds on average that will cost the council to commission independent people to undertake that review. And the review panel will meet and they will interview all those people involved. Um, and that would take usually one full day for them to undertake that. They then prepare a report, which would take another um, between, I would say, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours of writing the report. And then the what then happens is the relevant director then has to provide another report um, which they where they say whether they accept the findings of the, uh, the children's independent commissioners or not. So that's the one, pro uh, perhaps I've confused everyone with that process, but that's a, a separate process. But in terms of the length of time involved, it's massive in terms of the children's process. Um, but also there is a financial cost to it as well for, um, for the council. We have very few of those because my focus is in that area to make sure um, we, we, you know, we try and deal with this as best as we can so it doesn't escalate to stage two or three. But if someone does request it, we're obliged to provide that service. I think that's really probably all I need, all I had to say on that. I'm sorry it's so long. Ian, thank you, Councillor Goddard. Did you have anything you wanted to ask in response to, to that uh, answer? Uh, Chairman, thank you. No, that was a very comprehensive response, Ian, so thank you very much. Thank you. Move to Councillor Bliss. Oh, yes, I was going through some of these complaints and I've noticed quite a few that um, involve complaints about neighbours where there's antisocial behaviour, leaks, that kind of thing. And it says that we cannot tell the complainant what's going on because of GDPR. Um, surely if something is happening that needs to be dealt with, the resident has a right to know what's being done. Uh, yes, Council, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of like a twofold answer to the question. Um, the, the, the complainant or the resident uh, is entitled to know what action we're taking in order to address that. So if it's a leak or it's, uh, uh, we, we can then say what action the council is doing. So it might be that we're getting uh, a plumber in to fix the leak or whatever that is. So we, we will tell them in general terms, that's what we're doing. But what we won't do is we won't disclose personal information so, for example, in antisocial behaviour, if someone is complaining about their neighbour, we're not going to tell them what action we've taken against their neighbour, because if we did that, we would then be disclosing uh, personal information to a third party. So if, if I complained about my neighbour and the council then went and dealt with the neighbour, so we went and said, you know, uh, You've, you've, you've allegedly done these things, uh, we've, we, we've looked into it and we find that it's correct. We're not going to actually say any of those things, but we will say that we've addressed that issue directly with the, with the neighbour, but we won't tell them what action uh, we, we've taken as a result. Councillor Bliss, is that okay? Did you want to ask anything further in response or clarity around that? Um, yeah, I just want to follow up with, if we're not able to tell them what is being done, how do we know that what's done has worked? They usually come back pretty quickly, councillor, just to, to let us know, look, whatever you've done, it, it's not worked. We one of the one of the things with um, the 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 COVID pandemic uh, is the, is the actual sh because so many people are at home uh, for quite periods of time, the numbers of complaints that we now receive about antisocial behaviour uh, and also in terms of antisocial, the, the, the two areas, one, people complaining about what's happening about their neighbours above. So, for example, if someone's got a noise, they're, they're making a lot of noise or they've, they've parked uh, in, a, in a way that their neighbour doesn't like it. We end up with an awful lot of complaints about that at this present time. But people, if they're not happy with the response that we've provided them, the council's corporate complaints procedure allows them to escalate to stage two or stage three. So if, if we respond to them and say, look, uh, you've complained about X, uh, we've visited and we've done this. And if they say, well, actually, 
you may have done that, but it hasn't worked. I want that this now to escalate to stage two. We will do that if you know if, if that's the appropriate things. So they do come back to us pretty quickly to let us know it's not worked. And actually, there have been you know quite a number of those instances where we've had to go back and say, look, it's not quite worked. So what are you going to do about it to sort this one out for this person? Uh, noise complaints are an awful lot of the the number of uh, complaints that we receive um, that that you know that we've had to deal with. But you, you are right; we we do have to follow up from time to time. Thank you, Ian. A comment. Yeah. Thank you. Ian, a comment I wish to make myself, if I may, it's just around, I know you pointed out in terms of the resident services um, section where the the number of responses made within the target time was clearly lower than the others. I think I just wanted to sort of pick up that I think it's good that we've been able to drill down and identify where those areas are and effectively under your team, presumably apply pressure on them to uh, drive an improvement in that performance. Because I think if we have a target, that target has to be achievable and realistic. So if we're only currently getting 72% of it, that's a significant number that are that are missing that target. Um, so the fact that we've been able to identify the specific areas within that and hopefully work with them to improve that is something I, I look forward to seeing an improvement in when you present this to us next time. Uh, yeah, I agree, Chairman. It, it's a seven out of 10 isn't good enough really, to be honest, because many, many people actually complain about delays. And if the complaint process is not responding on time, it doesn't look good. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Ian if you would like to indicate? Otherwise, I don't see anyone else. So Ian, thank you very much for taking the time to present that. I know you've now done the, the rounds across, I think, all the different POCs. So thank you for, uh, for delivering it to us this evening. You're welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So that moves us to agenda item six, which is the scoping report for our review, um, which I think we, we discussed at a higher level at last month's meeting. Uh, Kevin, pleased to say, has joined us tonight to talk through the, the scoping report that has been provided with the, sort of the background objectives, the terms of reference and some ideas around who we'd like to speak to in terms of witnesses for the different sessions throughout the review over the forthcoming meetings. So if I can pass to Kevin to introduce it, and then we can open up for a bit more discussion to set out how we want to take this forward, if that's okay. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, we've presented uh, a, a scoping paper that Luke and I managed to cobble together um, with some suggestions as to about how you might want to go about your, your inquiry. Um, there's a number of different angles you could take, it occurs to us. Um, we thought it was important probably to look at how the voluntary sector has responded to the needs of residents during the period of lockdown, the first period of lockdown, um, but also then perhaps to look at how the, the, the sector itself has been impacted um, during that period, because we do know, and I've received feedback from a number of different groups that a number of them have, 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 have struggled with their services, not just because they can't deliver them, but because they can't raise funds or recruit volunteers, for example. And, and I think it just could be a useful way of exploring what that really means in Hillingdon. Um, a key factor in how we've developed our response as a, as a local authority was the, the Hillingdon Community Hub, which was done in collaboration with the voluntary and community sector. So um, we, that, that could be explored. So we've covered that in all of the terms of reference um, and, and um, put some suggestions in there as to how we, we might look at, or you might look want to look at uh, different aspects of that. Um, it, 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 there's, there was an awful lot that happened over a quick period of time. Um, so there is there's probably quite a bit that we could point to that we might have wanted to have done differently or it could have improved on. But actually, overall, I would say um, in, in mobilising the community hub, in delivering food, in supporting the community, I think that the voluntary sector and the council worked very well together and has delivered some, some good overall results. And we had some very positive feedback from, from residents in, in the same way. So it, it, I, I, it is really just a start of ten to see where the, whether this is the type of inquiry you'd like to embark upon. Um, we've suggested a few people you might want to to invite as interviews. That's that's obviously open to you. Um, but I would say the the folk at Hillingdon for All, at H for All, um, particularly the lead players there from Hillingdon Carers and Age UK, um, the food banks who we're now working very closely with, I think are important players now as we move to. Uh, more sustainable model of providing um, the food support across the borough. 
um, that, that might be needed, particularly as we may go into another phase of, of, of um, restrictions or people in isolation. Um, I've also suggested that the, the impact of some services in some areas, um, so we do know that the, the, the charities that are responding to um, mental health challenges, particularly Healing and Mind, but others as well, um, have, have been very stretched. They've, they've received further investment to some extent from um, the local clinical commissioning group. Um, so they've responded to that. So I think it's a, it's a positive response, um, but it has been a, a, a quite a challenge. And I think it will continue to be from where I'm sat. Um, so that's really, that, 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 that's what we're suggesting in terms of, of how 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 you might go about the um, about 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 your inquiry and you know happy to answer any questions or support it in any way you'd, you'd like us to. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, fr from my perspective, I think yes, this is the outline of this is similar to what my sort of expectation and initial view was around it. I think in terms of witnesses, I know there's been there's a number that are listed on page page forty eight uh, under section three. The part I think we may just need to be mindful and consider around that is potentially the order or the um, combination of any groups on the same meeting. Because obviously, I think as we as we know, the the Hillingdon Community Hub had to almost take over from Hillingdon for all. There was there was an element of support needed, but conscious that everyone played their part and wouldn't want people to feel that there was a criticism being levelled at one particular group. But also, I think there needs to be a realism that some areas and some community groups or groups in the voluntary sector did struggle and were not able to mobilise and needed effectively bailing out by the council in certain areas. So I think when we when we look to get those witnesses in, I think we just need to be careful that we don't um, put people in a, an awkward situation, but obviously want to make sure that we address what issues arose and work out how we are best to deal with those going forward. So I'm interested to open to the to the committee for any views in addition to those that have already been set out within the within the scope and report around the, the, the terms of reference, I think the background is how it is, but in terms of reference, effectively what we're looking to achieve through this report and then the evidence and inquiry part, um, if we think those are suitable people to attend, if, if not, or any alternatives or additions. So if anyone wishes to indicate, otherwise we will go with what we have. So Councillor Dillon first and then Councillor Goddard. Councillor Dillon. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for this uh, scoping report. Um, uh, I, I too, I'm happy with uh, what I've seen so far. And I'm glad we are uh, encompassing uh, our response to those charities. Uh, that's uh, very good. One thing I would like to ask is um, we've noted in previous meetings, uh, especially at council, uh, the increase in domestic violence. And uh, would we be able to, or would it be prudent to look at that area also and to what kind of response we've given to any charities or um our in council departments uh, within that area because it is one where there has been a significant increase in numbers thank you um it is it is an area where, where i understand the data is showing that there has been an increase so i agree it's a, an area of it's certainly an issue um I'm not sure whether that would take your inquiry beyond the sort of brief you first set, really, if you if you if it's a review of the current position in relation to domestic abuse. Um, there are a number of players in the borough who you could invite in from the voluntary sector. But I think you'd really need that to be led from the officer cohort um, who are talking about the services that, that are there to provide support for that. So I'm not sure it would become so much of a voluntary sector response review. That's just my opinion as an officer. Um, but I think it's it's within it's within your call really to direct it in whichever direction you wish. I, th I think on that I think we can we can look at it to see where where does the interaction come from. If it's if it's outside partners, then it's probably um, maybe more of a challenge to bring bring them in. If we can look to see how domestic violence was, I say the, the reporting of it was promoted. Um, through the beginning of lockdown, because I think you're right, Councillor Dillon, it was something that a number of parties raised was going to be an issue. I think how did we as a council react to that? What did what did we do? Did we engage with anyone? Did we? I think we, we probably did some publicity around it, um, but obviously it's one of those issues that is, it's a challenge to publicise as well, right? Because you're trying to target people without making it obvious that you're, you're doing it to people. So I think we can probably involve it to an extent, but probably not to the level of, maybe bringing in external partners around it, because I think that then may take it slightly wider. 
I'm happy with that. Councillor Goddard. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my, my question, I guess, is uh, related slightly to Councillor Dillon's, although perhaps slightly broader. Um, it, it's just striking to me that, as I understand the terms of reference here, we're talking about looking at the performance of the uh, of the voluntary organization um, during the period of, of lockdown. Um, I, I, but I wonder why it is that we're not, as I understand it, encompassing a review of the council's own performance um, in response to lockdown within that. Um, I appreciate that may not be the, you know, the, uh, in line with the terms of reference as originally defined, but um, but uh, you, you know, I would be interested to understand why it is that uh, the focus is purely on the voluntary organisations. So, in in response to that, I think conversations with with officers and cabinet around this drives that effectively the response to COVID and the lockdown and every, everything with it from the council is firstly still ongoing, and it's partly such a wide ranging piece that it would fall outside of one specific. Um, overview committee, whereas we as this committee uh, um, have the voluntary sector within our remit. My understanding is that the council will be as a wider organization conducting a whole a whole scale review on its response, but that would be something that is that is led at sort of top level outside above above us as a committee. Anyone else wish to indicate? I don't see anyone. So on the, in the absence of that, I think then we're broadly happy with, with what we have here. I think uh, given Councillor Dillon's comments, we can we can look to build something in further around that. And then I work with uh, with Kevin and Luke around bringing in the witnesses, lining up people up for those future sessions that we have coming up in the um, latter part of this year and earlier next year. Additionally, outside of meetings, if people think of someone else who they think would be good to hear from, or equally even as the review progresses, once we hear from one group or organization and then that leads to something further, obviously feel free to, to suggest or get in touch with um, all those alternative ideas. But otherwise then I think that that is good for us to, to agree. And then we can pay that forward and get that first witness session in for the meeting in November. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, thank you. Look forward to working with you on this. So, good night, everybody. Thank you very much. So, uh, Councillor Dinn, did you wish to speak or was that a wave? It was a wave, thank you, goodbye. That's fine, that's all right, good, thank you. Uh, agenda item seven is the forward plan. I think there was a slight amendment on this to what's been published, Luke. I think you just wanted just to clarify that. Yep, just a very quick amendment on the cabinet meeting that was down for the 22nd of October. There is the council insurance contracts item that's actually being removed from the forward plan. Um, the contract extension, I understand, um, has already been approved, so it, it shouldn't have been on there. Sorry if people had a raft array of questions around that. Um, does anyone have anything else on the forward plan? Otherwise, we will take that as noted which brings us to agenda item eight which is our work program just a couple of amendments from what was what's been published on that just in terms of changing a few dates around um nothing that impacts the next meeting i don't think um but oh it does actually sorry so the the local policing and community safety in hillingdon that that will be moving to january but will also be combined with the anti-social behavior part we talked around and the alligating scheme. So those are effectively going to be combined all in January. And the items that are currently showing as January, the safety of council owned properties and buildings and the Hillingdon First Limited update will move to February. Um, so Luke, I think we'll be able to circulate a new version of this either after the meeting or with the minutes if we can, just so it's clear for everybody. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, so yes, yeah, so, and then the, at the November meeting, we also have the review, the, the past review delivery around the recruitment that um, I think a number of members were involved in when that, that review take place, which was probably a couple of years ago now, um, but keen to get Mike Torber back in to give an update on what, how those recommendations that were agreed, how they've been 
implemented and what the outcomes have been from those. Does anyone have any questions around that work program? No, thank you. And again, I think the expectation is that these will remain as virtual um, until we until we hear otherwise. But I think fourth of November is is more than likely to be in this format. Okay, if no one, uh, last chance. If anyone wants to indicate to uh, make any comment on anything. No, I see nobody. So in that case, we can close the meeting. Um, as per the reminder of being, if you just remain online for a few seconds until the stream is closed, thank you for your contributions tonight, everybody. Thanks very much, Chairman. If everyone could just remain muted, I will just break the live feed. Thanks.